Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement 2. Let's take a look at something a little bit less retro on today's video. And if you don't like uh, non-retro stuff, you should probably skip this one. This obviously is my workbench that I do most of my work on. This anti-static mat here starting to get a little bit of wear and tear on it. Um, but that's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about the stuff that I regularly use to make videos, especially on the main channel. What you see here is a National Instruments virtual bench. This was very kindly donated to the channel by Tyler here in Portland. And I've had this thing for a little while and I've, I've recently started using it. You've probably noticed it on video captures on the channel, on the main channel that is. I kind of love this thing. It's not the most capable scope or multimeter in the world, but to be honest, it does those things great and it does them on screen, which means I can capture them very easily. It's a two channel scope. It's a multimeter, which is these connections here. It's a logic analyzer, which I actually haven't used yet. And then I think this one here is a bench power supply. So it's got like some fixed voltages outputs. I think these are switched outputs. You can toggle things off and on. And there's also a arbitrary function generator. And I think I used that where did I use that? I think I used that in a video so far. So this is pretty capable. It's plugged into my bench PC, which I'm gonna talk about in a second. On top of that here is my Elgato HD60S, which is an HDMI capture device. It's got in and out, and it's USB-C uh, 3.0, super speed or whatever connection to the computer. So this sends a raw 1080p image, well, up to that uh, data stream, that is at 60 frames per second, to the PC, which has to do the encoding using a video card that is capable of that. And behind it here, I have, uh, what is this thing? I can never remember. Open source scan converter. Hopefully that's visible in the camera. This converts from analog RGB to digital HDMI. I use this for like VGA capture. So it's got a VGA connector on the side there. Plug that into this device here for capturing the uh, HDMI, or capturing the VGA from the computer. So I've used that quite a bit. Anytime you see VGA capture, it's through this thing. I'm, I'm pretty pleased with the way it works too. It's not perfect, but I find that certain video cards capture, um, produce an output that this can capture better than others. Sometimes there's stripes and stuff. So I figured out exactly which ISA cards seem to work the best. And next to it right here is um, a RetroTINK. Is this like a 2X Pro? I think it's a 2X Pro. So it's got composite, component input, S-video input, and it produces HDMI output, which I then also connect to this. So I have to kind of switch around. I don't have a switch box. I should probably get a switch box, but I don't have a switch box. So I got to move a bunch of cables around right now. And then uh, that will do a capture. And all of that is connected to this thing up here, which was my lab PC, so to speak. It's a Frankenstein machine, just full of random parts that I had lying around. Some were donated, others were things I had. I kind of moved stuff around as I upgrade one PC in the house somewhere else. This thing kind of gets the dregs, so to speak, like the bottom of the barrel stuff. In fact, I think this case is donated. The video card in here was mine, but then I gave it away to someone else to use. Then they upgraded, so I got it back, and that's what's in here. It's a Core i7 third generation, I think, so it's decently capable, even though it's an older CPU. This is a mini ATX case. As you notice, it's not very tall, but I like it because it's got drive bays that are exposed. And these days when you buy a case, they might have one drive bay and that's it, like one five and a quarter inch. I had a zip drive in here because the older motherboard that I had in here before I put that Core i7 in was an AMD Phenom X6, X4, something like that. And it had an IDE port on the motherboard that this zip drive connected to and worked perfectly. Unfortunately, this motherboard that's in here, it does not have IDE on board. It does have a floppy port, weirdly enough. So this is actually connected to the motherboard, but no IDE. So I had this hooked up, well, I had the zip drive hooked up to a SATA to IDE adapter converter, didn't work. It just, I tried two different brands, refused to work. It just, Windows would see it. And if I tried to use it, it would just sort of freeze up the computer. And it's just a regular optical drive in here. I do use this occasionally to burn CDs and stuff as necessary. So it's nice that that's in there. I, I mentioned the flopping, it's plugged in the motherboard and it does work in Windows 10. And I gotta say it doesn't work very well. Windows 10 does weird stuff where it checks to see the 
disk in status of things. So sometimes you're just using the computer and all of a sudden this drive starts buzzing away, accessing, even though there's no floppy in there doing stuff. It's kind of annoying, so I actually have it disabled in the system right now. Uh, this case here, as you notice, has USB 2 and 3 ports on the front, but this motherboard, while it has USB 3, has no header on the board to plug these connectors into. So they don't actually do anything. So only the USB 2s are connected. And I know there's an adapter I could get to go from these to USB 2, but whatever, it's no big deal. I just used, uh, this is an SD card reader, a very cheap one. And I use that for micro SD reader, and then there's a little dongle for my <laughs> keyboard and mouse. So really the reason why I am talking about this computer is I think some people have asked kind of how I do my workflow down here on the bench. And this PC is integral to that workflow. I do everything on here from programming EEPROMs, analyzing files, reading documentation. I do all the video capture from the um, HDMI ca capture device, the Elgato. I do sound capture as well. There's actually a USB DAC down on the desk. I didn't point it out. It's plugged into the back of this as well. There's a webcam here, which um, isn't good enough for doing actual live streams, but I use the audio input on this to synchronize the video that I capture on here. Like if I'm capturing the HDMI stuff, I synchronize that sound to all the cameras. And you can see that I have my Panasonic Lumix mounted here. This is a, a mount I can move the camera around on because I face that down at the bench as necessary. Or sometimes I mount the Sony camera on here and I will record myself or Whatever, it's flexible because I have these quick disconnect things here for the cameras, it's very handy. I have the same di quick disconnects on all of the cameras so I can switch them out really quickly. Actually, now that I think about it, this camera actually has HDMI output, so I could do live streaming with this camera as well. I'd probably just need a ring light and just run an HDMI cable down to the capture device. Anyway, with this PC, unfortunately, it's been starting to have issues. And I know I've mentioned this on certain videos already, but besides the ones I've mentioned, which I'll get to in just a second, this has had weird problems where like, it just won't boot anymore. I'll turn it on and it'll count the RAM or whatever, look like it's gonna post, and then just sits there. They will not do anything. So not sure what was up with that. I kind of opened the cover. In fact, I go in here so often, I don't even keep the cover screwed on so see it's easy to open it up there and I just sort of jostled the cables and the cards that are in there and it started working <laughs> so I don't know and like it has worked since I haven't really had that problem anymore it's currently sleeping I do put this thing to sleep when I'm not using it so it's good that it's able to sleep and it always well it usually wakes up from sleep properly although sometimes it doesn't always wake up from sleep properly and then I have to reboot it that's very infrequent but the main issue that started happening with this bench PC, which has really made me upset and um, also makes it where I can't use this anymore, is the USB 3 ports on here don't work properly anymore. So when I say they don't work properly, they work like you can plug stuff into them and the computer sees them. It seems to work fine, but it's like the bandwidth on those USB 3 ports is insufficient like they're operating at USB 2.0 speeds. But the thing is, if you know Windows, Windows 10 is what I'm running on here, Windows 10 will tell you when you plug a super speed device, something that's full USB 3 speed into a USB 2 port, it will tell you that it's you made that mistake and there will be insufficient bandwidth if it's required. So if you plug in like a high speed hard drive in USB 2 port, it will say super speed device plugged in, you won't get the full speed. It'll pop up a little thing on the screen. It's not doing that. But yet, the capture device, which really does need the high-speed interface of USB 3.0, just doesn't have enough bandwidth to capture data properly. It really kind of made me crazy because capturing 480p through the Elgato works. Works fine. I think it's pretty much uncompressed data coming across that link. And I guess whatever speed that port is able to work at is fast enough. But anytime I try to capture 1080p, 60 frames per second, it just acts crazy. <laughs> like I'll get an image and it's running really slow. Like it's going at one frame per second instead of the 60 that it's set to, or I'll just get no picture at all. I use OBS, Open Broadcast System, I think it's called. Everyone uses that for streaming. It's a great program. I have to say it works really well, but when it's not happy with whatever video is coming in or the driver's not happy, you just get like a black screen. 
And it was kind of making me crazy. I actually thought that the Elgato capture device was bad. And I was pissed off at that. But then I plugged it into my laptop and it worked, worked perfectly. Same cable even, everything. So I reinstalled the drivers on here. No, no change. I reinstalled the Elgato capture software, which I don't normally use because I use OBS. I just use the driver from Elgato. I put their capture software back on. And sure enough, when I ran that and I'd capture video, it'd pop up with a little like triangle warning symbol and say two frames per second, you know, insufficient bandwidth. Or I forgot the exact message, but it, it, I could at least get a picture, very useless one, but it was showing up and it was giving me that warning. But OBS just did nothing. So like for a long time, this all worked fine. I mean, I had little issues here or there, but no problems. But then this just started happening all of a sudden and um, I can't figure out what's wrong. I've deleted the USB 3 ports on here. Re, you know, they re-found each other or they found each other, whatever. The drivers were reinstalled. It's um, not native to the chipset on this board. It's a really old motherboard, even though it supports this third gen chip in here. But the USB ports are like third party ones. Now, it's still using the Microsoft drivers, that are built into Windows. So they seem to be somewhat standard, but yet the speed is just not there anymore. There's also only two of them on the back. So there aren't a lot of options, but I've tried both of those on the back. There's no hub or anything. It's just plugged straight in the back of this machine. Both ports, same problem. Of course, I've gone through the BIOS settings and no, you know, there's nothing you can do there. You can just enable or disable those. There's no way to speed them up or slow them down. Whatever, this this motherboard in here has been flaky and failing. I think it's made by ECS. I've bought that years and years ago. I think I used it with the second gen Core i3 for a very long time. It was like a server, so it ran 24 seven. And it moved into here with this Core i7 when someone donated that to the channel. But ultimately, I need this machine to be 100% and work perfectly. This is the main tool I use working down the bench and when it's problematic, it means I can't make videos or I can, but I can't do video capture. And I've really started to rely on the capturing of video to make an interesting and compelling video. So with all of that said about this computer that's giving me so many problems, a viewer in town today, tonight in fact, dropped off a computer for me to replace this one. Let me grab it. And here is the computer. This machine, which is a big black monolithic thing. Well, it's not that big, luckily, because it can't be. I'll talk about that in a second. It's a Dell Precision T1700. So this is not like state of the art by any means, but from a performance standpoint, that third gen Core i7 that's in that machine is actually plenty of horsepower. It's quad core with um, hyper threading, so you get eight actual cores or, you know, four cores to use, but eight threads to run. I've never complained about the speed of that thing. It's plenty fast. I have a couple SSDs in there. You know, there's just no issues. And though, oh, the video card that's in there is an AMD, or maybe it's an ATI because it's old. It's a Radeon 7700, I think it is. So it's pretty old. It is supported by Windows 10. There's some AMD drivers that are installed on there, but AMD is no longer updating the drivers. This thing, from my understanding, it's a Xeon processor. It's also quad core, eight thread. I think it came out in 2014, the processor. I don't know when, um, oh, this still has the plastic on the, the Dell badge here. I don't actually know when this computer came out, but I'm assuming it was like around then or maybe 2015 or 2016. So I'm thinking that that's a little bit newer than that machine up there. So let me just peel these stickers off here and let's take a closer look at this new machine, which is going to replace the old one. Sorry about the noise. The furnace just turned on. It'll turn off in uh, just a second. So on the top here, there's a service tag and it has the manufacture date 2015 May 2nd. So I'd say that this is definitely newer than the old lab PC. On the front of the machine, there is an optical drive and there's another drive bay. So that's kind of cool. We have audio in and out. And then there are two super speeds. So these are USB 3.0 ports and then two regular speed connectors or USB ports right here. On the side of the machine, you can, I, I just wiped it down, which is what this is just drying off. 
Uh, it's got the really easy to remove side. Um, you just pop this off, I guess. Let's see how this, how this works. Okay, that's uh, pretty easy. Now one thing is, and we'll use the side here to help us with the uh, size of this PC. I need something that's relatively small. Up on the shelf there where that PC sits, there is just not a lot of space. So micro ATX motherboards, or is it, sorry, mini ATX motherboard is absolutely a requirement. I have some other cases up in the crawl space and they are full size ATX cases and they just don't physically fit up there. So the case that's up there now is this size. So this is uh, the side panel. So it's a little deeper, this Dell, um, than the other one. Not to mention, I think the front here, this part here, this bezel sticks out further, but that shouldn't be an issue, so to speak. Uh, let's see where the feet are. Yeah, the front foot's around there. Back one is there. So if this has to hang over the front of the shelf a little bit, no big deal. So I'm just taking a look at this for the first time myself. And I really like the fact it's got two five and a quarter inch bays. And it seems like uh, they do not use drive rails. So that's excellent. I can maybe put another optical drive in here or something like that. There is what looks like another three and a half inch drive bay right here for a hard drive. Although the cables that go to the front are sort of in the way. So that's kind of hilarious. It's not very easy to use when you have this thick bundle of wires right here. But anyways, uh, you just, I guess, put a hard drive in there if you need to and screw that in. Down here, there is another hard drive. It is a SATA drive of some type. This does have drive rails. It's held in by one screw. And the second bay right under here, uh, unfortunately there are no drive rails there. Oh, and there's a little piece of plastic that just broke off. There is a SATA cable sitting here. So I guess someone was using something at some point and that drive got removed possibly for recycling or whatever. Now I know that this machine does not have any personal data on it. I think this is a fresh copy of Windows on here. What I think I'm going to do is because this is an Intel Xeon is I'm gonna take the solid state drive, boot drive out of the other machine and just stick it in here and allow Windows 10 to reconfigure itself because Intel to Intel should be really easy. I mean, the generations aren't that far off uh, third gen to whatever this equivalent generation is. It's a little dusty in here, but not too bad. Uh, there's an MSI video card in here and I think, I don't see what it is. I can't immediately see, but I think this is like a TI 750 or something like that. I, the, the card that was in here that came with the Dell already was like a four display card, sort of a higher end. Well, I don't think it was a high end 3D card, but it was designed to run four monitors. Cause like this is a workstation, so to speak, you know, being a Xeon processor. So I think the idea was this would be used with like CAD type work or whatever. So it had a, a card with four display outputs on it. I think they were mini display port. So the person who donated it swapped it out with this 3D card, which has HDMI which is what I use. In fact, I think the connection I actually have is uh, DVI, but that's good because there's a DVI D port right here. Also HDMI and VGA. So it's a pretty capable card. That's excellent. Looking at the back, it's all pretty run of the mill stuff. We still have PS2 and serial, you know, just in case you need that kind of stuff. There's built in ethernet. Uh, we have two USB display port and display ports there. So obviously, uh, this has onboard video, I guess. Um, two more super speed USB ports and then two more regular ones. So four standard USB and then two super speeds. VGA, serial, <laughs> and sound in and out. Looking at this power supply here, it's interesting. There's a little button and an LED right here and there's no hard power switch on the back like to turn off the power completely to the, the machine. But I looked up the spec sheet for this machine and there were two power supplies that were possible to get with it. One was like a 200 and something watt one and another was a 365 watt, which is this. And it's 80 plus gold. So as generic as this power supply looks, that's pretty sweet that it's an 80 plus gold power supply. Uh, that means, you know, a little bit more efficiency. Looking at the motherboard, it's a pretty standard Dell affair. I think these things are generally pretty reliable, but also unremarkable. You know, it has a large fan on the CPU, so it should be relatively quiet and it looks like it's a four pin type, which means it has RPM control, PWM RPA control. So it will only run the speed necessary to cool the CPU. There's also a four pin fan here on the back for cooling the chassis. I'm sure that is blowing out. In fact, yes, looking at the fan blade profile, which I know you can't see, there it is. That is blowing out. 
If these are noisy, I can always order some like Noctua fans or whatever and replace these. But I have a feeling these are probably gonna be pretty quiet. This video card might be a little bit noisy, these uh, older MSI cards. I think these use up quite a bit of power. Although, now that I look at it, there isn't even a power connector on here. So this can't be particularly powerful. I'm pretty sure the AMD card that's in there, the ATI, has a four or six pin power connector on it. So hopefully this thing has hardware MPEG encode, which I absolutely need hardware MPEG-4 encoding for the video capture to work properly. From a RAM perspective, it's just two regular looking sticks there, no heat spreaders or anything. So it's probably DDR3, uh, because this is an older machine. So it's pretty easy to get that stuff. I have, a, I'm sure, a ton of DDR3 memory that would probably work in here. I'm noticing that this power supply is definitely non-standard onto the motherboard. There's uh, 12 volts here, that's for the CPU, obviously, and then there are other wires coming out of the power supply. Down here, there's five volts, 12 volts, and 3.3 that kind of goes onto the motherboard. Oh, and then there's this connector here, which is also non-standard with weird things on it. And then this cable that goes on the motherboard with these wires comes off that connector and then connects up to the hard drives and, and various things. This brown wire here, I'm assuming this is uh, 12 volts for a video card. It's a six pin connector right there. It comes down here, I think from the power supply. So I assume there's enough length here that it would be able to power up whatever card um, I had there that needed power. Looking around at the IO on this motherboard, nothing much to speak of. It's got four SATA ports, two there, two down here. I see like another onboard USB port. I don't see any onboard serial parallel or IDE or anything like that. So it's relatively legacy free, except for the PS2 ports on the back, which is kind of odd as, as, as I said. There is a little black wire that connects to something on the front panel here in the middle. And I assume that's an airflow temperature sensor. It plugs in the motherboard down there. Can't really see, it's just clipped on right here onto the front where the air would be coming in. There's also really no provision to put another fan up here. So hopefully this back one is, is good enough and won't get too loud. So anyhow, that is my new bench PC. Hopefully this thing is fit for purpose and will work for me. So I'm gonna start transferring components into this thing so I can see how it works. I figured before gutting the old machine, I should at least talk a little bit more about what's inside of it. So AMD Radeon R7770, that's what's actually in here. It does have a connector to power it, that is required. There's a 120 gig SSD here. There's another one mounted on the bottom of the case. Here is the floppy drive, which has this blue ribbon cable. And then of course, there's an optical drive. This currently has an Antec 500 watt power supply. It's actually 80 plus bronze, so it's not a terrible one. Uh, it's relatively quiet. And I actually, this is in here because I had to take out whatever was in this thing. I remember the machine would just shut off. Just, I'd be using it and it would just shut off. Or maybe it would reboot. I can't remember, it did one, either just turned itself off while it was sitting there doing nothing, or it would reboot. So I swapped out the power supply because the one that was in here was like a 380 watt older one. And that actually completely fixed the problem. You might be noticing that there's this big ribbon cable sticking out the back of the computer. And <laughs> what that is, is this is actually a SCSI card. Let's uh, take this out of here. It's an Adaptec <laughs> SCSI card. Yes, this thing has a PCI slot in it. There it is, it's a 64-bit PCI card. So yeah, old school, and if you didn't realize, you can just put a regular 32-bit slot, or you can plug a 64-bit card into a regular slot, and it does work fine. And uh, the reason why I have this ribbon cable hanging off of it, I uh, removed it, is because the connector on the back is this like high-density, low-voltage differential single-ended slash single-ended SCSI connector. I don't have any of those cables. They're really, really thick. So when you plug that in the back, it sticks out really far, and, you know, it bends the card and everything. It also has these um, types of connectors on here because it's SCSI 2 and whatever, all the fanciness. This is actually an Adaptec 29160. So it's a nice fast card, but this, believe it or not, as old as this card is, and it's, it's old, let's see if I can find a date. All right, well, I can't find any dates, but there is firmware sticker here that says copyright 1999. <laughs> this card is over 20 years old and it still works. The drivers I had to use are old drivers, like they're from Windows 
7 maybe, Windows 8, but they're new enough and 64-bit that it works. But to be honest, I never really use this card anymore. It's more of a hassle than anything else. Um, probably better off just sticking this card or another SCSI card into one of my older retro PCs, like the Pentium 3 I have, or maybe I need to build up like a Core 2 Duo kind of era machine running Windows XP, put a card like this, put some other old PCI cards in there, and use that for imaging because I just never use this card in this machine. So this will not be going into that machine, even though it's got a PCI slot, I am not reusing this card anymore. So that's coming out for good. Really the only other thing in the bottom of this is actually uh, as a PC speaker, as you can see, um, it looks like I zip tied it on the bottom. So that is there, uh, you know, PC speakers don't really do much anymore. In Windows, it never, ever, ever beeps. I think I really just put this here in case the machine had trouble booting and had some beep codes and I wanted to hear that stuff. So that is hooked up. There's also serial and parallel header. That's what these ribbon cables are here. Hook because this motherboard actually has working serial and parallel. I just never use it. So that's pointless. The floppy connectors down here as well. What else is remarkable, if anything, about this computer? Really nothing. It's pretty boring actually. It looks like this case has holes here for water cooling. <laughs> if you ever wanted to water cool a little case like this, it's just so small. <laughs> On the back plate here, VGA, HDMI, um, and DVI. It looks like it's got one PS2 port. There are two USBs, two super speeds, and two more USBs, plus Ethernet and sound. Um, I think I had the sound hooked up. The front panel sound actually works on this. I had that hooked up. And that's the video card, which does have HDMI and it has dual mini display ports. It actually has four outputs on it. But yeah, that's that's it. That's the whole machine. Um, I don't think I'm gonna transfer, as I said, the floppy drive over. And I can't even really connect it anyways because this power supply actually has Berg connectors and regular Molex connectors and the Dell does not. But this thing always annoyed me anyways. I'll just go back to using a USB external drive, which works perfectly well. So that is the old machine, which is being retired. All right, I did a little reading up about the card in here, the 750 Ti. This card came out around 2014, so it's certainly not new, but um, this ATI card here, this is the 7770, it's a Radeon HD 7770. This came out, it's a gigahertz edition. I remember when I bought this, this came out in 2012. <laughs> I replaced this card with a, a GeForce 1060, and um, I still have that. That's the card I'm running upstairs for gaming and rendering and stuff. But like I said, this went to someone else, and then they got a better card, and then I got this back. Because this is even older than that, I'll definitely try to work with this TI. I was looking up NVIDIA's website on the phone here, trying to see what features it had. If it had the hardware encode, it didn't really mention it, but it says sports like G-Sync and other stuff that I definitely won't use. It's just a little suspect that it's got the VGA connector on the back. Not quite sure about that. Anyhow, um, I replaced the one terabyte drive, which is actually just sitting up here right now, with my two solid states from the other one. Uh, and I noticed that the, the three and a half inch adapter I was using actually supports two of the two and a half inch thin drives like the solid state. So I have them both mounted together right here. I'm not intending to keep this hard drive in here. I just wanna see what's on there. I think uh, the person who donated this might've copied some files on there. So I will quickly take a look at that, but I'll definitely probably be taking this out. I don't really need a spinning hard drive. I don't need storage capacity in this. My network attached storage has something like 38 terabytes of space in it right now. I keep buying 14 terabyte drives and adding them to it. Uh, so it's got lots of space. So all I need room for on this is to capture the video footage, which doesn't take up that much space. That goes to one of the SSDs. And then the other SSD is for booting. And plus I have a little bit of you know programs and whatever else on here. But even like my Google Drive and everything else, that's all on the network attached st storage. The NAS has that stuff. And gigabit networking is good enough. Oh yeah, you know what? I, I think I'm gonna install a Promise IDE card, <laughs> like a PCI one. And then I'm gonna try to put a zip drive in here because <laughs> I really wanna get a zip drive working again. 
I have the zip drive sitting over here. Here it is. It's just a regular ATAPI. Oh, but then I have the problem. Okay, I before I do that, I think I'm gonna not do that tonight because this hasn't been in the computer for a while anyways because it hasn't worked. I need to find a SATA to Molex adapter or I just need to kind of cut into the cable here and just solder one on. I mean, I could do that too. There's 12 volts right here. Um, that's so sketchy. In the other PC though, I had that three and a half inch drive in that five and a quarter inch adapter. I will just take that, put this in there, stick that in the front of this computer and I just need to worry about how to get the, uh, the power connected. So I'll do that at another time. I'm not gonna do that now. Okay, let me stop talking. I'm gonna put the cover on and plug this in and let's see if it works. All right, the Dell is just roughly placed on here. The side cover is still off and I haven't connected all the connections on the back. I do have the keyboard connection here, the power, the ethernet and the display. So that's enough to get started. A top tip from me is if you have a PC with a bunch of ports on the back, take a picture with your phone and do a very clear photo first. That way you can tell what's where when you're trying to reconnect stuff. And for me specifically, the super speed ports are these two right here, but you know, there's a bunch of USB ports and stuff I won't be using like these display ports. So it's very helpful to have this handy. So I really recommend that as a top tip. All right, so let's press the power and see what happens. It's come to life and I have to say it's pretty quiet. That's awesome. All right, the screen is coming up. Let's see, how do we get to the BIOS? F12, F12, quick. Preparing the one-time boot menu. I always like to go check out the BIOS options first. Oh, Broadcom, Control S. This must be the, maybe that dual port NIC is a Broadcom. Oh yeah, it's listing it twice. So I assume that that is it. Yeah, the MAC addresses are one apart from each other. I think that this computer has TPM 1.2, which is actually good for me because I use BitLocker, but the other machine had, of course, it was a consumer motherboard, so I had no TPM in it, which meant I had to type in a passphrase every time I booted the computer which is not a big deal. It's just annoying if uh, doing Windows updates or whatever. So I will be enabling BitLocker to use the TPM on this machine if everything goes well. All right, we have a mouse that works. Okay, so here it is. There's the service tag. Ownership date, uh, 5-15-2015. It looks like it was made uh, on the 6th and it was already started be to be used on the 15th. There it is for anyone who's interested. It's a Xeon E3-1241 version three at 3.5 gigahertz. It is recognizing my solid states. I think the HP is the boot drive, although I can't quite remember. That's funny, there's a Thunderbolt option on here. So enables to disable the Thunderbolt device support. What? What, what port exactly would that be connected to? Okay, I've gone through everything and I'm just gonna reboot. All right, well, it's booting off the hard drive. <laughs> I could tell uh, as in the spinning rust hard drive, which I don't really want that to happen. So I'm gonna actually kill the power. Come on, there's no reset button on this thing. I'm holding the power button down. I'm gonna disconnect that hard drive. I don't want it, I want it to try to boot off my um, solid state drives. But I actually don't really like that there's no reset button on there. I just realized, um, that's a bit annoying. You have to hold the power button down to get it to do anything. All right, try number two, like for the second channel. All right, I have turned on legacy boot. Maybe I wasn't using UEFI on the hard drive in there. And you know what? I think that's the case because that Windows 10 install was being used on like a really old motherboard with the AMD something or other from like 2009, which really there's no UEFI on something that old. So. I'm gonna set the HP drive as the boot drive and let's reboot. Aha, good sign. All right, it's booting. What's gonna happen? Is it gonna work? I, I assume it's all gonna work. And then the question is, when I plug the capture device in, will that work? Because theoretically, oh, there it is reconfiguring the drivers. Theoretically, the problem may have been that there was something with Windows that was screwed up. I mean, I really don't think that was the case, but could be that nothing was actually wrong with the hardware. Okay, we're at the desktop. Obviously the video driver's not working, so let me just go and download the latest NVIDIA drivers. I that would support this card at least. And then I will come back to you. 
All right, everything is seemingly working well. I haven't actually tried the video capture yet, but uh, the machine's booting up. I have the very latest NVIDIA drivers, like the most current ones installed on here, and they fully support this particular graphics card. So that's excellent. I have the TPM enabled as well. I configured it and then I migrated from password mode over to using a TPM. The key to switching BitLocker over from a password at boot over to TPM is a command line tool called manage-bde, BitLocker Disk Encryption. Sorry for the weird angle, but I am gonna take this opportunity now to try to remove this front panel. Looks like it has a broken clip. No, I just wanna get this front thing off the drive bay. <laughs> okay, definitely this front cover just pivots off. There it is. <laughs> so this is what I was trying to remove and wow, it was stubborn. It does have a clip here, but it's really stuck. Feels like Dell designed this to come out one time and snap off in the process. There we go. Like it had this thing here and it, it, I had to bend it over just to get it out. All right, so the zip drive goes in here. I mean, I can't hook it up yet because I don't have the right adapter, but I can at least go through the heartache to install it, right? Ah, uh, okay, I just cut myself. Good quality case there, Dell. The inside edge right here, so sharp. And I was holding the case from moving while I screwed it in and it sliced my finger right there on the edge and it's, oh, it kills. I kind of thought the days of cutting yourself on PC cases were over, especially with machines like this. The thing probably cost thousands of dollars when it was new, and yet um, it just cut me. All right, there's the zip drive installed in the case. I just need to figure out how I will get the power hooked up. I'll figure that out in the future. And what I do is I always take these covers, like, because I don't want to lose them since who knows, nothing will fit, and I just slide them inside the computer. I just leave them in the bottom. Yes, it floats around, but I'm not moving this computer. And even if I did, it's just a piece of plastic. You'll hear it, you'll open it up, look inside. So leave them in the bottom so they don't get lost. So if I do want to take this out because this never, if it will never work, I'll put the blank back in. All right, so the system is booted up and I have all the USB peripherals connected. So I just launched VirtualBench and there it is. It's uh, absolutely working. If uh, you hook up Virtual Bench or you run the software that is and the device itself is not powered on, it gives you an error and lets you go into like a demo mode. But that is sweet, that is working. And I did have a little bit of problems once before where sometimes the Virtual Bench would lose connection to the computer. I think I figured out what was going on there. The USB cable from this to the machine wasn't quite long enough. So I had a little extension cord connected, a USB extension cord. But the one I was using was like the thinnest, crappiest extension cord you've ever seen. Basically, the USB cable was even thinner than this clip lead, and it had, of course, four wires inside of it. The virtual bench is powered, so it doesn't need power, so to speak, over USB. But the data signals, I mean, there should be some shielding, and there was none. So <laughs> I put a really thick, beefy extension cord, one that had ferrite magnets or beads or whatever those are called on each end of the cord and that's what's extending it now. Hopefully that eliminates the problem where this would sometimes go offline, especially if I power something off and on like AC electrical device, you know, that send a little spike through the, through the air. Anyways, okay, so that's working. Thumbs up to that. I'm gonna fire up OBS and let's see if the capture device is working because that is the key. So HDMI and I'm gonna power on the retro tank which outputs a 1080p signal. Actually, the Tink does not output a 1080p signal. Let's turn it on anyways. This was definitely not working. Okay, that is a great sign. I'm gonna hook up a Commodore 64. Zip 64 on the bench. Let's see. Uh, oh, uh, power's off, uh, power supply's off. It has a power switch on it. I don't always turn it off, but occasionally I do because I haven't been using the 64s lately. I've been working on other stuff. Power this on. Okay. Hmm. Hmm. All right, I don't know. This does not look good. What I need to do is connect the monitor's HDMI cable. Wow, there's just a disaster of cables here. If I plug the monitor into the output of the um, Elgato and I switch the input to HDMI, it does pass through 
whatever the retro tink is sending out of range. Okay, that's fine. The, the retro tink may be set to the wrong mode. I think that's what's going on here. Let's see here. It's got a couple dip switches on the side here. No, out of range. Okay, there we go. It's line doubling. Switch this mode here. There we go. That's the better mode. Boy, I really need something better for this mess of cables. Okay, so there it is. Let's power cycle this. I, this, this machine gets jail bars. <laughs> and sometimes when you power cycle, the jail bars go away. They're there still. Let's just keep turning it off and on until I get a clean jail bar free image. Usually it's like every other time is jail bar free. There it is. No jail bars. Very well, there are some, but they're almost invisible. Okay. Anyhow, let's switch back to the DVI input on the monitor. And let's see what we got. Oh, it's working. Awesome. And I can tell it's working because when it was screwed up before, what would happen is you would sometimes see an image, but as soon as you started typing, uh, let's make this full screen. Uh, there we go. As soon as you started typing, there was so much delay, uh, like because of that data problem on the USB 3 ports, that there we go. Look at that, it's freaking working. That is such a relief. That is what I needed this machine to do for me. And I really didn't wanna reinstall Windows from scratch because there's so many programs and need special drivers. If I reinstall Windows, I have to redo all of that stuff again. This install of Windows has everything configured that I need. And um, now we have a working 64. In fact, you know what? It's been a long time. Powering up the speakers here. I have the audio here. I'm gonna plug it into the 64. This particular 64 has, uh, you know, in case you don't remember, has a modified or removed RF modulator. So there's actually an RCA jack for composite. And there is a 3.5 millimeter audio jack for sound. And there is no SID chip. Let's put a SID chip in this thing. Here's a little case with some SIDs in it. I'm gonna put a real one in here. There's the arm SID there, swin SIDs there. I know a viewer has also sent me the FPGA SID. So I do have that to test. So that'll be coming up in a future video. Is this really a SID? Am I, what am I doing here? Am I really putting a SID in here? Let me just put my goggles on and look very carefully. 60, yeah, SID, okay, and the notch is at the top, so I do not want to damage a real SID or whatever this chip was. Okay, there it is. And let's get the easy flash cartridge because that's what's sitting right there. I'll move this stuff out of the way and plug that in. Powered up. All right, we got the gel bars, but whatever. We're gonna do an 8-bit dance party. Oops, uh, let's go back. Adrian's tools. 8-bit dance party. I think the speakers are way loud here. Here we go. go, an 8-bit dance party. And yes, you know, the whole time there's a Windows uh, mouse cursor on here because we are running in Windows here. Like uh, here's Spotify. Okay, well, telling me something went wrong with Spotify. But yeah, we are actually running the 64 through Windows. And what's pretty cool about the Elgato actually, when it's working properly like it is now, there's not a lot of delay. Um, it's pretty responsive. I mean, yeah, you wouldn't want to play an action game through it. The retro tank is very, very low latency, like half a frame or something like that, because it's just a line doubler. But the Elgato capture device is not bad. It's really not bad. So typing and like working this way is actually completely fine. So normally if I'm doing stuff that I'm needing to capture, I will just go to this full screen mode, but I can just um, exit out of it like that. And I am back here, you know, in the normal mode. Anyhow, it's freaking working. I am so excited. 
So this video has been super long and I've rambled a lot and it has nothing retro except for the 8-Bit Dance Party. So if you did watch this far, you got treated to that at least. I'm really excited to have this machine. Thank you very much to the very generous person here in town who donated this to me. You know who you are. I am sure you're watching. It's awesome. It totally works. It's nice and quiet. It fits on the bench. Actually looks relatively cool as well. And now I just got to figure out how to get that zip drive hooked up to the power. So yeah, that's it. This works. I'm excited. I'm hoping for trouble-free operation so you won't hear me complaining anymore about the machine not working and I'm not able to make a video. <laughs> All right, there we go. If you thought this was interesting anyway, thumbs up. Subscribe really helps the second channel. Comments down below. You know all the usual stuff. Uh, thanks to my patrons. Their names are scrolling up the side of the screen. And I guess that's going to be it. So stay healthy, stay safe, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.